Well, I am Claudia Romo Edelman, and this is Iri Losh, and this is the Global Goalscast. The podcast that asks, can you change the world? And we're pleased to be here today with Laura Liswood, who's the Secretary General of Council of the Women World Leaders. It's comprised of women presidents, prime ministers, and heads of government. In 1997, uh, Laura founded, co-founded the White House Project, which is dedicated to electing a female president of the United States. We're pleased to have you. Yesterday night, we got uh, a conversation with two explorers that went to Antarctica, actually, as part of our podcast with devices. They went 60 days, 600 miles, only on renewable energy. And they had no idea about the Me Too movement. They came back and there's a new reality. There's a lot that happened in the world uh, when it comes to gender empowerment and women coming out and women speaking. Can you tell us, Laura, what do you think this will really mean and whether this is going to change things and whether you think there's a potential backlash? Well, I think there's a lot, a lot what you just asked in those questions. And first off, it's great to be here. Great. Yes. Nice, nice to see you both. I think, first off, it's very interesting to say how quickly some social norms can potentially be changed. You know, you've got your explorers who are gone for a couple of months, and they come back mm. to this sort of shock. A new world. A new world. You know, new questions, new visibilities, new prescribed behaviors, you know, new social actions, et cetera. And although I think part of it, all of this has sort of been part of a wave of things that have been going on in terms of women and women's equality, gender parity. I mean, these kinds of things are not done in a vacuum. You know, they, they, they come from... You know, women and you know the, the million women the march where five million women mm. marched. You know, uh, last year. Last year. Yeah. Like building up. Well, the, well, the women's march was you know also symbolic of the kind of what's been going on. You know, um, I think it's it is interesting. It might be a little too soon to tell about how this all fits together. And you know, is this going to be a, a progressive movement, part of the progressive movement, or is this a one-off kind of thing that you know, okay, this has happened and it's this big flurry and then. Five months later, it's gone. Have you seen this kind of thing before? Well, you know, I think other things have sort of erupted Mm -hmm. periodically around this. But, you know, it seems, you know, and I don't know what sustained means anymore. Sustained used to mean 10 years. Now it Mm -hmm. means, you know, three months kind of thing. Um, But, you know, one has to hope that, you know, the two steps forward, one step back actually does get you on the journey continue on the journey, because I think there are potential back steps to it, including what you just talked about, which is the backlash. You know, I think that there there are potentials for that. I, I know I've had men who, who I've known for a very long time, you know, I go to hug them and they go, well, can I can I kiss you? You know, just a friendly right. kiss. And I go, of course you can. You know, mm-hmm. but it's it's on their mind, you know, at this point. So, you know, but that's, that's just reducing something to the, the ridiculous in, in a way. I mean, we're go, we're talking about women who have been, you know, who've been harassed, who who've had their jobs threatened, who, you know, that's different than giving someone a kiss. Well, there has been like at least in my memory, a lot of progressive movement. I think that this was a spike. And the question is whether we can take this spike to create momentum and keep on actually just like advancing the agenda. Uh, but again, just going to the backlash, because one in every four girls in the world experiences sexual violence. And if you think of that in real terms, that means that if, if any, uh, you know, like class room photos or whatever you call them, the photo albums, a yearbook, uh, that means that every four persons has been abused. Mm-hmm. And that has a familiar face because normally it's the father or the uncle or someone. It's not the CEO that is famous on the, you know, Hollywood or in the media industry. So having people that are somehow coming out and using the opportunity and using the momentum of me to to say like he kissed me or i i feel uncomfortable and that's that's enough could backlash a little bit of the real issues that we're dealing with here so do you think that there is any danger there would you give advice to people that are in this movement right now and say like okay so watch out there's a potential backlash if well, I think you're absolutely right. We need to, when, when these kinds of things happen, we need to open the aperture. You know, we need to make the lens bigger in the sense of what you were saying is, well, you've got this group of women from a very developed country making, you know, money, et cetera, but they, they've been able to get some um, notoriety. They've been able to get some media attention as they should. But then you have to say, but wait a minute, what's happening in, you know, in developing countries? 
you know, what's happening to on the ground all the time. You know, now what we can hope is, is that because of that question, the question, you know, of the, of the actress, for example, who got sexually harassed, that actually then, then is tied in a cord, you know, it's, it's on a line to those one in four girls, you know, kind of thing, that that's opening up, okay, the dialogue, say, well, yes, this is happening, but incidentally, this is also happening, you know, mm-hmm. so to me, that, that's to the good, if that conversation can happen. If that conversation now. Do I think there could be a potential? I mean, you know, you even reference the fact, well, some men don't want to take meetings with me. Some men don't want to mentor women right. anymore. Mm-hmm. Some men don't want to take them out to dinner like they would take their male colleagues out to dinner, where you develop the bonding and the relationship and the kinds of things you need to get ahead right. in an organization. Mm-hmm. But you know, I'm semi not worried about that if an organization has structured ways of men mentoring, senior leadership mentoring junior people in a structured way, you know. So it's just not this one-off, oh, come have drinks with me kind of thing. So that just says, no, we actually need more policies and procedures around things that benefit dominant group members or, you know, don't benefit non-dominant group members. What about the scene in London last week where I live in the Dorchester Hotel with an all-male event, male leaders hired a whole bunch of female hostesses who then were harassed, hands up the skirts, propositioned, a whole lot. I mean, it was horrible. To me, living in London, it doesn't feel like the same movement has reached there as it has in the United States. Do you see that it's, can it spread? Well, one hopes. I mean, I think even this, you know, Mm -hmm. situation and how quickly it became such a, a news event, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but, but it is, you know, it is a bit head-slapping, isn't it? You know, because you're, you're sitting here thinking, okay, we just had all this big conversation around sexual harassment and all of that. So you think, what are these people, these male leaders, thinking mm-hmm. when they go in? Or not or, Well, you know, <laughs> or, or not thinking. Is, yeah. or, or how yeah. is it that their annual reports of their companies can mm-hmm. talk about how important it is to have diversity and inclusion and women's development and leadership. And then they, they themselves personally, do they not think that there's, I think, I think one of the good things, if you can call it a good thing, is that s- leadership now is going to be, be m- more clear about reputational risk that happens when they do these kinds of things. So whether they truly care about women, whether they truly care about diversity, whether they truly, you know, embrace it, or they just understand that, hey, we've got to say this. If you say, wait a minute, when you do that, it's going to be a reputational risk to your company, Mm -hmm. you know, to your shareholders, to your investors. The Financial Times put it on their cover page. Uh, normally, you know, they have the wall pay, and uh, as soon as it reached the half a million views, they open up the wall, and it's now in 1.2 million views, the, the story of the President's Club. Uh, so it's, it's, it's going like fire, and people are reading it and consuming it and putting it on the blacklist. And talking about the blacklist, I think that the World Economic Forum probably had a lot of like people that they normally have, you know, like deleted from their invitations for this year in Davos, because independent of the degree of the accusation or, mm-hmm. you know, like I am no one to judge whether, you know, like someone has made a big uh, sexual harassment or a minor sexual harassment, and I don't think that the rules of the game are clear there yet. Uh, whether someone feels uncomfortable, it has been probably put on the same pot as someone that has been raped. But think about that. That blacklist is not going to be there for long because probably we'll we'll start to understand better the issue and we'll start to differentiate. So there's probably going to come to a rehab time, isn't it? So how do you think that it's going to be when men are starting to come back and start saying like, okay, listen, I made a mistake. I want to now help. Or what, what do you think is going to come? Well, I mean, it's hard to know when an epiphany will actually occur to someone, you know, and to and what creates the sort of change in their own mindset. Mm. Personally, I think watching other men's behavior helps. Right. You know, so, for example, in the in this event, in the event you referenced in mm-hmm. London, the private club, you know, if a critical mass of the men had said, "Wait a minute, don't do this," you know, stop, this is inappropriate, mm-hmm. you know, I think that's what might have stopped the behavior. You know, so uh, men talking to m- other men because of. Men see other men doing it, men, powerful men doing this kind of thing. Well, it must be okay. 
It takes place in a city where there are men only clubs where they have had meetings about whether to uh, to bring women in, and it has been voted down as recently as last year. I mean, it's incredible. How are we ever going to move the needle if, if <laughs> we don't bring them on board? That's kind of my, my point, is that you've got to bring them into this conversation and, and make them understand, and I don't know how to do it. Well, you certainly do have to bring men into the conversation. And that's here at, at, at the forum, there's been a lot of discussion about, okay, how do we bring men Incredible, into yeah. this? Mm-hmm. You know, and, and, you know, I think at least I think we can say, well, maybe we had some success. You listen to Justin Trudeau's speech, you know, which I suspect was about 80% on women in his comments. Mm-hmm. You know, you listen to Macron, you know, who talks about women. You listen to Jack Ma, who talked about women and the, and the importance of getting women into the economy and the skill sets and, and how economies have to engage women. So, you know, you, now you're seeing some role models out there, some very powerful people. Man ambassadors, I heard them called. Well, man ambassadors, <laughs> nice, nice word. We have other kind of, you know, man interrupters and all of that right. kind of stuff. There's nothing wrong with mansplainers. You know, man ambassadors is probably as a good a term as any. So, you know, see, but you do have to get to a tipping point. But then the real question is, that these men truly embrace, you know. Right. I mean, and it's not, I think, that people are evil. It's just that, you know, like with these all men's club, that it's just comfortable for them. Mm. They're around people who are like themselves. They don't have to, hold, you know, have anything guarded about their behavior or changing their behavior. Right. It's a relic of in, in, in mm. time, and I think they ultimately will, particularly in, I know in the United States what's been effective is that um, shareholders and investors have asked is our co- is the money is the money for jo- joining this club coming from the corporation? Mm-hmm. You know, and if it's coming from the corporation, it has to stop. Right. You know? And but I think that, quite honestly, that's one of the ways this stuff stops. You were mentioning Trudeau and Macron and and some other you know heads of state talking very strongly about gender, but not all of them are, and some of them have been a bit abusive in their language when when it comes to women. You think? Um, <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, there's at least one president I know who I'm I, I doubt will be hired to do the sexual harassment training. Right, right. But talk about that for a second. So, how do you get? Um, how do you get more women into politics? And, and that's part of what you uh, what you have been saying in your book, um, the loudest talk, and in you know, like in your own campaign, you want to help women um, to get into politics and ultimately become president. How are you doing it, and who do you see that is potential? Do you like Oprah? Well, everyone likes Oprah. I mean, you know that's just yeah. You know, l- let me start first with you know clearly. If you want to find sort of the, you know, as they often call it, the pony in the pile of, you know, <laughs> yeah, it is that women have been activated, at least in the United States, and I think in other countries too, uh, to run for office, to get involved, to have these five million women marches, you know, that kind of thing. So there's been a real catalyst, a real, you know, if you say there's a backlash to something, mm. there's been a backlash to what they've seen of these people in power, you know. So... One, one is clearly we have to get more women into political positions because they're going to hopefully change laws. They're going to hopefully be role models. They're going to hopefully, you know, bring women's issues to the fore. You know. So have to do that at all levels in all governments, you know. Um, and for, you know, generally speaking, hopefully women will progress. Right. You know, they'll become the governor of a state and then they'll run for office. You know, one of the challenges like in the United States is – we need at least three women mm. running in, in each of the parties. And you know. who are you supporting mm. to do that? Well, I'm, I'm not supporting anyone well, particularly. You, like, you? But I certainly don't need three self-indulgent female billionaires, you know, <laughs> running for office. I need three qualified women, mm. you know, but running. But you couldn't have had a more qualified woman than Hillary Clinton. I mean, let's put it on the line. Mm. Secretary of State, she couldn't have had more experience. Yeah up against a misogynist person who'd sexually assaulted women. Yeah. Well, it turned out that, you know, apparently somewhat unbeknownst to that campaign, um, experience wasn't the driver. Mm-hmm. You know, ex- what was the driver was this visceral sort of message to people who have felt left out of the economy, you know, mm-hmm. who voted. And, you know, let's 
remember, of course, that just because of the quirk in our election system, she did win more yeah. popular votes. So, you know, she did. She actually was seen as the more, the better yeah. quali- qualified yeah. candidate, just the way our system works, you know, mm. that didn't happen. Um, she was very experienced. Uh, you know, she herself could have perhaps done some things differently in the campaigning mm. that she did. You know, was she, was she, what I hear from virtually every head of state and government, you know, and I've heard it for now 20 years, over-scrutinized. Mm-hmm. Over scrutinized, over scrutinized yeah. uh, by individuals and by the press. Yeah, mm. the tolerance for mistakes for women is less than the tolerance for mm. mistakes for men. They are scrutinized on their hair, their dress, the their way their voice, voices, their voices. When I went on yeah. Sky News the weekend before the election, she had lost her voice in Las Vegas. She was at the, it was at the end. It was the end of the election. She'd been standing outside in the rain. And she was speaking to her supporters, and they came out of the clip from that and came to me and said, oh, she sounds a bit screechy, doesn't she? And I thought, come on, you just can't use that language. You're not going to say Donald Trump sounds screechy, doesn't he? Well, and some of the research will prove that that's exactly what happens. You know, she screeched, he forcefully spoke. Mm. But I want to ask something, Laura. Um, What are women saying, at at least, you know, like, I'm not not asking you to quote anybody, but what are women saying behind scenes that or doing with, with all this movement and the reaction to male leaders are talking and acting and handing your handshaking the, the way? How, what, what's the behind the scenes language really well, about look all at this? These, these women see this kind of behavior. They've seen it before. They've been potentially subjected to it before themselves. So that, you know, for many of them, and I you know, can't say how many or all of them or what, there's a bit of eye rolling going on. But it's not that they haven't experienced somewhat similar kinds of things. It's not that they haven't seen the testosterone levels go up, you know, with the men around the table. But now that there's a movement of empowerment, maybe, you know, like beyond the air rolling, maybe there's a desire to come and bite or bark a little bit more. Well, we'll see. You know, don't forget, heads of state and government, you know, with, yeah, with some <laughs> exception or, you know, are relatively diplomatic. You know, the, the, the rules seem to have changed a bit with, with this particular president who's pushed the barriers a bit. It's interesting. I was speaking to the prime minister of Norway yesterday or two days ago. I'm slightly losing track of time. Um, and I asked her, well, you know, you've managed to convince Trump to come out and say might be able to you know, go roll back some of what I said on climate change. How did you do it? She said, well, it's amazing when you speak their language. So I went and just pointed out all of the the business reasons behind investing in a green economy and pointed out how many Teslas actually get driven in Norway. And he said, oh, that's really interesting. And he came out afterwards and then said, of course, I don't know, we could roll back some of the things on the Paris Accord. And, um, and oh, and by the way, I'd really prefer to have migration from Norway. Well, the migration from Norway comment was a bit much, you know. Um, but, well, look, at I think women in particular have figured out how to deal with men. You know, how to, how did she said speak the language. Well, you know, what she's saying is, okay, I've figured out what makes this guy tick. You know, I've observed this, you know, and women do that. Women are far more aware of the dynamics than men are of women's dynamics mm. and everything. And, you know, you mentioned my book, The Loudest Duck. I call that the elephant and mouse theory. You right. know, if you're the elephant in the room, you don't need to know anything about the mouse. But if you're the mouse in the room, you need to know everything about the elephant. And so women have been historically, you know, the mouse, the mouse in the right. sense of out of power, et cetera. And, and let me ask you the last question. So how do you see Davos, you know, like in five years? How, what kind of animals would we have if not elephant and mouse? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and we, um, look, at, I've been coming to Davos for quite a long time. So I've been able to see the arc of change here at the forum. I mean, initially when there were some women's things here, they were not in the forum itself. They were out in the Congress Hall. They were out in one of the hotels. Then they finally brought it in. They started the Women Leaders Initiative in 2002. You know, the forum is also a mirror of society, Mm -hmm. right? right? I mean, they're trying to also shape society, but they're also a mirror of it. So if you say, who are our main clients here? They're CEOs and chairmen, right? Okay. Well, as we know, there's, you know, the number of women CEOs and chairmen can basically fit in the phone booth, if you could find a phone booth. (laughs) (laughs) But it means 5%, 6%. So the very fact that there are 20% women when their major client base is 5% women, 6% women, is really interesting. 
you know. But it, but it's it's always things like you know the the seven women chairs. It's mm-hmm. who are the women on the panels. You know, it's what are the, what's the programming? What are the issues that get brought up? In addition to who are the women who come here? So five years from now, you know, I mean, unfortunately, because the gender gap report has actually shown that we're losing. You know, it's taking us longer and longer to close the gender gap. I hate to think it's now it's 217 years. It was 170 last year. Now it's 217 or something mm-hmm. like that. So my optimistic self doesn't want it to continue to get, you know, further and further behind, I think. But so I think, you're, you're saying elephant and the mouse, but more mouse. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that that's exactly what will happen. You know, the forum is not going to stop the initiatives that it has on gender. But the world is not going to change that much. <laughs> But yeah, the, 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 whether they're pulling the world along is another question. Right. Well, Laura, um, thank you so much for being with us in the Global Goals Cast. And, um, and I'm Edie Lash, and this is Claudia Romo-Edelman. Thank you for being with us. Thank you.